We did have one quilt in our house that my grandmother had made. That was um, very comforting. And when you didn't feel good or you were sick, then you got wrapped up in that quilt. Just the quilt itself was comforting. I always say a blanket warms the body, but a quilt warms the soul. That I, I want my quilt to be like a hug, but that it's with you all the time. You wrap up in it, it's like I'm giving you a hug. Yeah, so that's why I, my quilts are meant to be used, not just displayed. And so I sewed pretty much my whole life, did the Girl Scout badge. My mother sewed, and my sister did. And, um, you know, we had a sewing machine, and it was out, and we used it a lot. And so everything I do, I quilt on my little home sewing machine. I don't use a long arm. So I, mine is all hand-guided. When I do the machine quilting, I put the feed dogs down. So that means there's no tension holding that fabric still and you can push that fabric wherever you want it to go. So, what they call stipple quilting, it's like little wiggles. It's kind of like doodling with your hands. Probably my earliest memory is of a baby quilt that was made for me, which I still have. And uh, I remember as a little girl, my quilt was always with me. It was a lovey. It was a comfort. I didn't have a pacifier or anything like that. I had that little quilt that was always with me. And then my great-grandmother made a quilt that was a butterfly pattern. And it was always on my mom's bed. Always. And I still have that quilt. It's in very poor condition, but it still represents that good feeling of mm -hmm. warmth and comfort and love. So some good happy memories there. Mm -hmm. Definitely a connection to the past, and they represent family. So I'm an accountant by training and did that for a number of years. When I finally quit and was able to just stay home and be a mom. My friend who was the president principal of Notre Dame Academy in All Girls High School in North Kentucky, we were in Bible study together and she came in and she said, I had the worst day of my life today. The teacher who teaches accounting and journalism came in today and said she's quitting and not coming back. And I said, oh, well, maybe I can help you. And she goes, yes. And then the textiles teacher came in and said she has emergency surgery the second day of school and her eyes got real big and she looked at me and she goes, oh, maybe you can help with that too. So <laughs> She knew I had the quilt grant, so I ended up doing both of those. So I'm teaching quilting. I mean, that's the goal of this class. These, these girls learn how to use a sewing machine and, and some construction, but what they sign up for that class is to learn how to make a quilt. So now I get to like pass this on in my job, so it's wonderful. And I, you know, I don't think it would have happened except for the Kentucky Folk Art Grant because it gives you of credibility as an artist. Yeah, it's really led to a whole new career uh, for me, and um, I love it, and I love the girls. I feel like I touch the future. With teaching, you know, it's like, it's an awesome, in the true sense of the word, uh, responsibility that you um, are like molding and shaping, not just your kids, but all these other young people uh, to take uh, their place in the world. I think each quilt has a lot of symbolism and a lot of meaning. For instance, our first pattern that we chose for the uh, grant was the log cabin pattern, which represents home and hearth. Um, the center block is traditionally either yellow or red to represent the fire and the hearth of the home. So as a quilter, you would know that. When I'm working on a quilt, usually it's for a specific person. Sometimes I'll even like have music on in the background that reminds me of that person while I'm working on it. But if I'm making a quilt for you, I pray for you and I think about you when I'm making that quilt. 
So there's um, all this like intangible love that's already in and um, concern for your well-being is, is in your quilt that I hope goes with you and just like becomes part of you. I think there are like places even that you go and it's like the prayers stay behind. You can feel that the prayers are here. You can be sensitive to that sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I hope that sometimes the person who receives the quilt will have an inkling of really like how much prayer and love is in that when they get it. We talk about everything, kids, husbands, uh, life. Our jobs. Yeah. What's going on, problems, share concerns, and, and listen. But we have we been can... friends for so long that we know each other so well and yeah. we confide in one another. Yeah. So we can just come and spill our beans and... Yeah. And this quote, Grant, really gave us the opportunity to spend more time together. It did. I mean, we were very st structured. We do like to get together, but this gave us a legitimate reason yeah. to tell the family, <laughs> we are quilting today and you can't bother us, you know, or whatever. That was really um, a credit to our families as well, that they respected at that time that this was important to us. I try and take fabric from other quilts and incorporate them into the next quilt or a couple more quilts so that they're all kind of tied together with love too. Mm -hmm. So that we're literally, you know, that we're all connected. And so I kind of try to literally, physically put a little connection in all the quilts. For me, part of the holidays is pulling out the right quilts for the holidays. Halloween, fall, Christmas, spring, summer, yeah. And I don't feel like I have all of my decorations out right. until I get my quilts out for that holiday or that season. Yes. Yeah. That's a definite focal point for my holidays. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I learned oodles of things from Patty, but my very favorite thing that I learned was an easy applique technique. And she taught me how to take a piece of fabric and add interfacing with it, cut it out, stitch it, and then turn it using a chopstick to get all the seams out so they're beautiful seams and then press it. And you have a beautiful piece and they just come out so perfect and so pretty that I just think that is the best thing since sliced bread. My sisters are both quilters and I was just with them in California and we each brought something to teach the other two. They just couldn't get over how easy that was. My one sister took all of my examples and took them home with her. She said, I have to know how to do this. This is great. <laughs> so just something so simple, but wow, so easy, you know, and, and so, so much fun. And we were able to share that technique as well as other techniques one night at the local library here in we Fort did. Thomas when <laughs> we uh, just gave a quilting demonstration. We talked about the history of quilting. We had all of our quilts hung up around the room and we talked about the Kentucky Folk Arts Grant and explained our journey through that grant. We had like standing room only crowd for the library. And so there's a lot of, I guess there's a lot of interest some of the people, a few were quilters, but most of them were not. Mm -hmm. They just came to hear. We called it quilting a thread from the past to the present. So we kind of tried in the history and of quilting our history and then how we're carrying it forward. And, and I do feel like we talked to a lot of the women after the presentation, and I really feel like we got them excited about quilting and mm -hmm. I think some of them went on to do yeah. something with quilting. Like I turned things inside out and like tried to use a pencil to get the point but a pencil is too pointy and it'll poke a hole in it 
and then you've kind of ruined it. Then I'm like, okay, what do I have? I'm really good for, like, repurpose, recycle. And um, like, what do I have that I can use? And I keep a chopstick upstairs to stir my coffee in the morning. <laughs> I could use a chopstick. So um, when chopsticks are disappearing from Chinese restaurants, I'm the culprit. Because I even, you know, I took this to school, taught all my students. I'm like, I know there are people all over the place now reusing their chopsticks or quilting. And then, the, you know, the other thing we did is down here to get your table high enough. You know, I was getting a backache. And I, you know, your kids go off to college and you buy these little bed risers so they can store stuff under their bed. And I'm like, aha, I need my table to be higher. Um, yeah, I bought these bed risers and we put the tables on them and it's like the perfect work height then mm -hmm. without yeah. investing a lot of money. And she gave me a set for my birthday, so now my table <laughs> and my sewing room is up high. I was yeah. cutting last night and it's so much easier because it's right, you know, it's just that much higher that you're not bent over. We saw these ironing boards in a Paducah, and they wanted a fortune for these. They call them the big boards because your ironing board is pointed and you're ironing something really big. So I told Bob I wanted this and he made it. Yeah, and he made it to fit the top of my ironing board. And so you can iron a whole piece and then move it. So it's so much more efficient. I saved jars for buttons. When you need the brown button or the red button or whatever, it's like, yep, I don't have to look through a mess. I can just go to a jar, find a red button. Yeah, some of them are old, you know, mustard. Or jelly jars. Yeah. She gave me a cute little set of oh. jelly so that I would have cute jars for my buttons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We were going for the jars. <laughs> She definitely makes me do and be my best, Aww. and she, she does, and she Thank really you. encourages me to finish projects and to keep going, and um, I'm way more productive since we started the quilt grant than I ever was. Okay, so this is my quilt journal, and I, I put things that I ended up finding I was checking myself all the time, what is this? I wrote them down in the front like the standard sizes for beds. Oh yeah, that was the first one. L Elizabeth's quilt, the log cabin. I finished it in 2001. Um, then I did my daughter, Laura, and um, I did both my son. I tried to make a note of like what sizes. These were, Joe's the same. I made a duvet cover, pillow, I, you know, bunch of pillowcases. Here I start to get a little more detailed. Oh, that's the one a maple leaf I made for my birthday. So I, I tried to, when I got better, I tried to make notes. This one I ended up giving away, so I note who I gave it to. This was another. Uh, see, here I started getting a little more detailed what size pieces I needed and all that kind of stuff. And then I try to take pictures. I'll look more at like what I call the movement in the fabric and let the fabric itself do part of the work. And I don't necessarily get overly complicated in the piecing. I think you can be just as creative and have a, as wonderful a piece with a little less piecing as long as you pick the right fabrics and then you're not you know, I'm all about being efficient, you know, not killing yourself. You know, you'll never get it done. And I think you've taught me that, <laughs> where yeah. I tend to think big and more complicated. You teach me to be simpler. Oh, okay. You know, like your, your quilt <clears throat> hanging above your couch upstairs is a good example. Because mm -hmm. you use big squares in that. Mm -hmm. But the effect is stunning. It really makes a statement. It lit a fire under both of us, this yeah. quilt grant did. Right. And through what we experienced there, we're sharing it with others. Yeah. I mean, there's certainly more quilters now than when we started this. Yes. Yeah. 
and even the people who aren't are more appreciative of quilting history mm-hmm. and the art. And you know, the, the other thing is, is it really makes me take ownership of myself as an artist. Because I went in the art gallery, we went to Florida on vacation, went to art gallery, and the lady goes, are you an artist? I'm like, yes, I am, you know, rather than just saying, I'm, you know, a hobbyist or whatever. It's like, no, yeah, I really am an artist. So it's kind of new to think of myself as that way, but to, yeah, take ownership of it. It really, to me, shows the investment in the arts pays such big dividends that you can never imagine or see. I mean, people say, oh, yeah, the art, it's important to study art and to support the arts, but it's like, oh, it makes it so concrete to see how just a small investment in the arts really creates opportunities and possibilities and just results and way beyond the, you know, like the pebble in a pond. The ripple effect. The ripples just keep going out. Mm -hmm.